around 2014, I was asked by a, a very interesting institution in Paris called Le Bal if I wanted to do my dream show. I'd worked with them a little bit before, and they said, you can do what you like. I was very interested in the kinds of unspoken connections that happen between images. And I really wanted to make an exhibition that was something that kind of stretched the idea of how one image might relate to another and another. And it came together very quickly. I knew exactly what the show was going to be when I was asked. It was going to be... Uh, it was going to have a source. And the source was going to be this image here. Well, is it by Man Ray? This is a complicated point. Uh, it's 1920 in New York, and Man Ray knows a bit about photography, but primarily because he taught himself photography as a way to document his paintings and his sculptures. And in his memoir, his very unreliable but very entertaining memoir, which is at the far end of this, Vitrine. Man Ray uh, explains how one day he was asked by a collector, a woman called Catherine S. Dreyer. He was asked to photograph her collection. She was about to set up an institution. It was going to be like a forerunner of the Museum of Modern Art. And she said, Man Ray, you know about photography. Can you document the works in my collection? And Man Ray grumbles in his memoir. He says, the thought of photographing the work of others was repugnant to me, beneath my dignity as an artist. So that already sets up a strange tension between a photograph that's made as a document and being an artist or wanting to be artistic with your photography. But about two pages later in the memoir, he says, well, I needed the money, so <laughs> I agreed to do it. And then a few pages after that, He's visiting his friend Marcel Duchamp, the French artist who's living in Paris, on Broadway. And Duchamp's studio is thick with dust. Duchamp's been away in Europe, and he's deliberately left the windows open. He's collecting dust on a sheet of glass, and it's going to become his work, um, The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelors. Even, also known as the large glass. Man Ray grumbles to him. He says, oh, I've got to photograph Catherine Dreyer's collection. And Duchamp says, well, why don't you practice on this? The dusty sheet of glass. And Man Ray describes setting up the camera. And he says, I looked through the viewfinder and it, it looked like maybe the surface of another planet. Uh, we opened the shutter. We went to get something to eat. We came back, closed the shutter. So it's a long exposure. He said, I processed the negative that night. It was perfect. I was confident of all future assignments, is what he says. Which is strange, because it doesn't really look like any photograph of any artwork I know. But maybe it couldn't, given the subject matter, the source material. And it first gets published in 1922, so two years later, in a journal called Literature. There's no mention of what this photograph really is in the journal it's given a full page and in fact part of the caption is view from an aeroplane so it's a complete lie as to what it actually is and the photograph doesn't get exhibited you know hung on a wall until the 1960s but it has a strange life in and out of various avant-garde magazines, journals, throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And as you probably know, Duchamp was this kind of cultish figure, so was Man Ray to an extent, and there was a great discovery of their work in the early 60s. And if you pick up a book on Man Ray, this photograph is usually presented as a sort of visionary work by a visionary artist, you know, at the onset of photographic modernism, surrealism. If you see it in a book on Duchamp's work, it's a document. It's like a production still <laughs> in the making of his large glass. Well, artwork, document, process, sculpture, photography, image text, context, 
all of the things, the complicated questions that fascinate us about photography, it struck me, are kind of bound up in a very kind of nascent and explosive form in that picture. But over the years, through my studies and through my sort of general ruminations on photography, uh, it came to be an important image. And it, I also got the impression that it was an important image for lots of other photographers, lots of thinkers about photography over the years have referred to it where they're talking about either avant-garde work or even trying to define what the medium of photography is. Um, and I thought that is an interesting starting point for a show. And everything that you see in the show runs with, in one direction or another, something that is sort of implied by that picture, not influenced by it. It's not a show about other photographers or photographic artists being influenced by Man Ray and Duchamp. It's, it's much more to do with sort of resonances and possible connections than it is influenced. The title, Handful of Dust, comes from an extraordinary coincidence. So when the photograph was first published, so when it, it's first made public, it's in October of 1922 in Paris, where it's titled View from an Aeroplane. Also in October of 1922 in London, T.S. Eliot publishes The Wasteland, you know, the great modernist poem, which contains the line, I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Uh, when I realised that they were both published exactly the same month, it's, it's just another coincidence that you can't ignore. I can't ignore. I'm always struck by coincidences. I sort of live for them, really. The title was a gift that came from that coincidence. This is by Gerhard Richter, who you probably know as a painter. And in fact, this piece is called 128 Views of a Painting. Uh, it was actually made here in Canada, Halifax, 1978. And Richter photographs the surface of one of his paintings. And he's kind of ranging across it, slightly forensically, slightly shallow focus images. You never really get to see what the painting is. And he made it as a grid of fiber-based prints, slightly smaller than this. And when I was first putting the show together in 2014, 2015, I really wanted that piece. And it was in a museum in Germany that was being restored. And they said, no, you cannot have it. And I was distraught because it was such a key work for me. And the director of Le Bal, she said, show me that artist book again. And she looked at it and she said, huh, tritone prints. OK, we'll show that. I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, we'll cut the book up. We'll, we'll just show it like that. And Le Bal has found all kinds of innovative ways of showing photography, particularly of making books exhibitable. So this is all the images from the 1st to the 128th. And because we don't have to really preserve them or look after them, we can just drop this plexi straight onto them. So it's got this kind of sheen finish underneath which is this very kind of painted finish. So it's a kind of play on smoothness and roughness. I like the fact that when you lay it out, it's kind of got the feel of the original glass of Duchamp's large, large glass. On that wall, that's a book by Ed Rocher with a couple of friends. It's called the Royal Road Test, made in 1967. Uh, Royal here is that typewriter, it's a famous make of typewriter. And they drove through the desert just outside Las Vegas, I think, got up to about 100 miles an hour and hurled the typewriter from the window and it bounced and smashed and they photographed it like a kind of police investigation <laughs> so it's got these very deadpan captions and that's actually just two copies of the book and so we just took it off its spiral and placed them on the wall in these two works you can get this feeling for a kind of forensic relation to photography and that really comes through in this piece here it was shown at the Museum of Modern Art and it was in a catalogue called Mirrors and Windows and I got really fascinated by it because 
I looked at it and I wondered what has the artist just found something you know has he stumbled across something and he's photographed it has, has he made what's in front of the camera you know so is it more process and performance and sculptural in fact it's all of those things so Duvola was breaking into abandoned houses some of which had already been vandalised a little bit and then he would extend the vandalism so he'd take various materials with him uh, aerosol cans uh, maybe a scalpel and would just be a bit more arty about it but I think you can tell that he knew that they were going to end up as photographs as black and white photographs because there, there are certain kind of tricks and things that are happening which really only come into being once, once they're photographed Oh, these two are by another Canadian, Jeff Wall. I got a really angry email from someone. He said, you David Company, I went to see your show looking for the Jeff Walls, and you didn't have any. Because uh, everyone expects Jeff Walls to be large and narrative in their implications somehow. Just called Rock Surface. It's one of a number of diptychs he's made over the years, actually. They have an interesting relation to the work of Frederick Summer, who photograph the sonoran desert in this sort of semi-abstract way which are next door on the wall and I, I like them they were very clearly in my head for the show right from the beginning Robert Burley made a number of pictures about the end of the analog era of photography and this is actually from a sequence of four pictures uh, that show the implosion of one of the Kodak manufacturing plants in Rochester and the dust cloud billows up and it actually comes towards this crowd who are former employees. Most of them are carrying digital cameras, traitors. <laughs> <laughs> Kodak was just one of those classic... I was having a bit of a reinvention. I know they're re-releasing Ektachrome and things like that. But it was one of those classic 20th century companies that just couldn't adapt to the digital era. It was too, too different. So in a way, it's photography... It's, it's shot on Kodak film, so it is photography recording its own death. But, you know, the death of photography gets announced every decade or so. It always rises rather phoenix-like, doesn't it? Take some other form. There is no death of photography. Louise Oakes here. Yeah, they they were made in response to a huge debate that was happening in the UK. Well, it's sort of happening it here as well around fracking, where you pressurise fractures in rock to try to release gas. It has all kinds of horrible ecological consequences, and so they are they are images where Louise Oakes has has gathered earth and dust from the from the planned proposed sites of fracking in the UK and they're and they're modeled on the the fracking maps that were drawn this is by Nick Watlington British artist who was involved in a big project where lots of photographers were commissioned to go and take pictures in Israel with no more agenda or obligation than that and Watlington mainly photographed um, settlements but he made this which was a little spin-off project he found an area of land that that was the Israelis had claimed from the Palestinians and all they used it for was to dump their consumerist trash 
and it was usually picked over by young Palestinian kids looking for something of value or something that could be reused or recycled. And Watplington is a photographer and a painter. And he made a series of photographs. Uh, he also made a series of paintings. He feels that they're both documents, in a way. They are, they are both responses to that place. And he very specifically has them exhibited as pairs, one photograph uh, with one painting. And it's an interesting idea that it, you know, could be a document. The video by Kirk Palmer, which has an extraordinary soundtrack. He's a British artist and he, he makes a lot of his work in Japan. Makes films shot 16 mil black and white film and it's shot near Kyoto and Kyoto was earmarked by the Americans to receive a nuclear bomb and the target was changed at the last minute to Nagasaki and that place it, it, is a place that is that escaped. It escaped because of a kind of bureaucratic decision change by the American military. In that film, there's a lot of drama, but nothing happens. Mm -hmm. It's of a very, very beautiful forest shot in this kind of silvery black and white. And there's some kind of commotion. Um, the wind starts to kind of whip up the leaves and the branches and there's a kind of crescendo in the soundtrack which suddenly cuts out and everything goes calm again and you wonder what you've experienced you know was that was that something or was that nothing at all you can see now why I, I said at the beginning it's it's a show that's about resonances and, and connections between things and not really about influences the only picture that was directly influenced by it uh, is th this one by Sophie Risselhuber. Risselhuber's a French artist, and in 1991 um, she saw a photograph in Time magazine, an image taken from a French fighter plane, part of the quote unquote Allied forces, that was clearing Saddam Hussein's army back north out of the deserts of Kuwait. She saw that photograph in Time magazine and decided there and then she wanted to photograph the evacuated deserts of Kuwait. It's what gets called the first Gulf War. She walked across the terrain, she photographed from a plane as well, and she made a body of around 70 pictures that she called Fet, deliberately small book, not an epic book, an anti-epic book. Fame means fact, but also done. There's something quite cold and clinical about it. Anyway, 70 odd photographs. But there was one photograph that she didn't include. And that was this one. Because she said that when she was there, although she was inspired by the image in Time magazine, what was really on her mind as a visual template was the Man Ray photograph. And in this picture, she came too close to her inspiration. So when the book was published and when the work is exhibited as a big grid of 70 pictures, this is not in it. She was slightly embarrassed by it, <laughs> but it was too similar. It's strikingly similar to the Man Ray picture. 2007, she issued it as a sort of freestanding picture called A Cause de l'Elevage de Poussière, because of dust breeding. So the show kind of ends here in a way, it's a sort of full stop and it's got a nice symmetry, it's in this back corner and the Man Ray is on the opposite front corner and this is the only one that's a direct influence, everything else is just a strange resonance, may have a connection, it may not.